When we attacked Tarawa, the main atoll Bishio was surrounded by a coral reef, or actually segmented reefs. Coral grows anywhere there isn't fresh water. So on any island that's got a river where large quantities of fresh water are coming into the lagoon, the coral dies and there's a natural opening into the lagoon. Well, Tarawa doesn't have a river. What happened was the British, who had held the island before the Japanese captured it, actually notified, they warned us, that the tide would be such that it might be low enough that some of our boats might get snag, hung up on the reef. They might snag. They looked at the tides. They thought they could get the Higgins boats over. But when it came time to, to actually invade, there was an odd neap tide, and the reef was, was exposed. There wasn't enough water to get the Higgins boats over. The Marines had to get out, in some cases, 800 yards through the water. The Japanese machine gun and mortar fire just decimated them. I knew which battalions were going to be first landers, and I wanted the guys to be with them. So a couple of weeks before we were to offload or, or load onto ships, rather, uh, I sent my guys out to these battalions so that they could know the people in the battalion, know the commanding officer, and, uh, and so that the people in the battalion would know that they were with them weren't strangers. And so I picked for myself the battalion commander I thought would be in the trouble the most, and that would be where the best pictures would be made. And his name was Jim Crow, he was a major. We landed on Tarawa about early, supposed to be eight o'clock in the morning. They postponed it and we finally went ashore at 8.30. I was in the first wave and the first and second waves were amphibious tractors. We got ashore, but in getting to the shore, we rode on coral for about 600 yards. And, but all of a sudden, he saw the amphibious tractors that had carried in most of the first three waves uh, sort of piling up against the pier. I jokingly later used to say that it looked like an automobile junkyard. They were piling up on each other because the pier stopped them. But what was happening was that there was a Japanese machine gunner buried in a tank top on one side over there and he was shooting machine gun bullets at these, these, these tractors and and they weren't heavily armored or anything. And we got ashore and we tried to climb the wall and of course the gunners were out. By that time, the gunners were out. The uh, Air Force had done its preparation and they'd quit and uh, they shelled the damn thing and they said, well, there's a, somebody told me that the shelling for Tarawa was supposed to be about equivalent of four, square, four, four pounds of TNT per square foot of land. He says, that much explosion, they're going to sink the damn island. But uh, when the track landed, two of the guys went off the right side. They're dead. They're still there. Two of them went over the wall. They're dead. They're sitting there. And the rest of us just sat there for a while. And, but that was causing Jim Crow to sit out there and say, I'm losing my beachhead. I don't have any beachhead in there, and I've got all these boats coming in. We were in Red Beach 1. Next was Red Beach 2. The Japs denied the left half of Red Beach 1 to us, and all of Red Beach 2, all the way down to the pier. Cox and Gunder. And away we went, and as he hit the reef, which we knew he would do, why, he pulled the gag to lower the ramp, and it wouldn't go down. So that meant we all had to go up over the side. The side of the, of the LCVPs was about shoulder height on me. The boats hung up anywhere from four to 600 yards offshore. 
guys have to get out and wade ashore and just all of the portion of the beach that they didn't have, the Japanese machine guns were in force and they just riddled those people. They were also using anti-aircraft guns and shooting at those people wading in. After, after uh, uh, Jim Crow put us in on the beach, uh, the first boats to come in, and I was sitting there with my back to the seawall, loading a camera and having to watch this, as soon as it hit the reef and dropped the ramp, a shell would come in and hit it from the other side of the island. Blasted all the pieces. You'd see the boat blown apart, people blown apart. And this happened half a dozen times. Sitting there, not being able to do anything to stop it was one of the worst feelings I had during the entire war. It's a helpless feeling. Those guys needed help. There's nothing we could do about it except watch. I think that uh, Jim Crow at that point had the only radio that was active, and he radioed the, the ships, the, the command ship out, uh, laying offshore, don't send in any more troops at all until we figure this thing out and we're able to negate it. As the day wore on, all of the battalion commanders on the beach, three, three beaches as it was called, uh, were very concerned because they knew how many Japanese were there and they figured that there'd probably be a banzai charge in the evening and the dark, dark set in that would really get those of us that were on the beach and hadn't gone in very far, you know? And so uh, uh, there was talk about from the ship outside of bringing in the replacement boats after dark. So they put out the word, practically like, for the love of God, don't send anybody in in the dark because we won't know who's on the beach. And as it was, a half a dozen Japanese crawled into our beach in the night and were stabbing the wounded laying on the beach. And the next morning, we had enough people come in behind us to help out. We were able to go down all the way to the other end of the island where we'd been the day before. And there's another tank trap that tied into the one we had. And that night we were able to secure that tank trap. We had enough people to go back and clean out the damn pillboxes that were behind us. See, everybody, both in the European War and the Japanese War, everybody was dug in. The Germans had wonderful dug in emplacements, you know. And so you didn't see them until you crawled up, if you did, to throw a grenade in or something like that. But, uh, but uh, it wasn't like the old day wars when people were out on the open plains running against you, you know. Uh, they didn't do that very often because everybody would be killed. Mr. Rao was actually the most intense fighting in a short period that I ever saw. And if you talk about being scared, I was scared on Tarawa. But when I first went into combat in the Kabuto and Tanambogo, this was a big lark for a 16-year-old. He was having a ball. But there were no more balls from then on. From thereafter, any time I got into an amphibian tractor on an assault, I was scared silly. And each additional assault, I was more and more scared. The, the law of averages was going to catch up with me sooner or later, and I was always afraid now was my turn. In that 76 hours, there were a little over a thousand Marines killed, and uh, about 1,250 some odd Marines wounded, and pretty nearly 4,500 Japanese killed. We never actually failed at Tarawa. We, we won the battle and were never really in danger of losing the assault because we outnumbered the Japanese, we outgunned them. It was almost inevitable that we would win and secure the island, but it was a horrific carnage. It was not until the third and fourth days that we finally destroyed the Japanese resistance. We realized we had to get tighter, we had to keep them in maneuvering and had to get them in, in the compact formations, which is what we aim for at Normandy at D-Day. 